Hello, folks. We are back here. Today is the August 9, 2021, and I'm going to talk about the magnetic forcing electric charges. This chapter is rather simple, and I'm going to show you some examples of how it works, how this magnetic force on electric charge works, and then we move on to other topics. The section on the book is 19.2, okay? So it's magnetic force on a point charge. So suppose that we start with a uniform magnetic field. There's a way to produce something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we put an electric charge in this magnetic field. Can be either a positive or negative charge. Okay, so, so let me share the screen here, right? Okay, but I'm gonna start sharing the screen here. Hey, here he goes. So let's start again. We start right in here with magnetic force on a point charge. And in the book is section 19.2. You have to know about that. And so suppose that we, we start here is a magnetic field, a uniform magnetic field in space. That's the B is all about. And we put a point charge in there. Right now I'm putting a positive point charge, Q greater than zero. Well, one thing that we observe in nature is that if the velocity of the charge is zero, if the charge is at rest in this magnetic field, there will be no magnetic force whatsoever. Similarly, if the velocity vector of the magnetic of the electric charge is parallel to the magnetic field lines, the magnetic force is still going to be zero. Right? Here you go, zero and zero. However, things start to become interesting when the velocity vector of the electric charge is, for instance, makes an angle with the magnetic field. In this case, the magnetic field is making an angle of 90 degrees with the velocity vector of the electric charge. In this specific case, the, elect the magnetic force is going to be given by what we call the right-hand rule, okay? And the magnetic force also is mathematically expressed by this formula that you see here. What you see right in here is a special vectorial product. This cross that we, we see here is the vectorial product, okay? We can multi, we can operate, you already know about sum and subtraction between vectors. There is also the scalar product between vectors. And there's this other important product between vectors that we call the vectorial product, V cross B. How do we, how do we work with this vectorial product, okay? So when we cross product two different vectors, we get, we still get another vector. So how do we do that? How do we cross product those things? You just use the right-hand rule in this case, okay? So here you go. In the book, explain that to you, but I'm gonna explain that to, to you as well. So you go ahead, you know, you lie down the palm of your right hand along the first vector, in this case, the V vector. But it has to be the right hand and extend the thumb at 90 degree angle. You rotate the palm of your hand from the V vector towards the B vector. The direction, direction of the thumb is the direction of the resulting vector. In this case, it's gonna be the magnetic force. Okay, so here's the direction of the force, of the magnetic force. 
That's what happens on 90 degree angle. If the angle is not, oh, and by the way, the magnitude of this force for this specific angle of 90 degrees is going to be maximum. It's going to be Q times VB. If the angle between the force, the magnetic field and the velocity vector makes an angle theta, like you see right in here, the direction is still going to be, you know, going out of the board, going out of the screen, but the magnitude will have a sign of theta there in the final solution, okay? So that's what you have to know. You have to know about the vectorial product, okay? So, so let's write it down here. Find out the force, the magnetic force, the point charge. You must know the vectorial product. Must you know the vectorial product? Okay. Which is represented by a cross, which is represented represented by a cross. I need you to practice this vectorial product. The relation is given by, the relation is given by what you saw in there. Well, I'm just copy and paste. There we go. Like that. B cross B. Have that in the book as well. Here you go. Okay, here's another example, V cross B in the book. V cross B, the force is going out of the board, okay? So what counts in this vectorial product is just the components of the velocity vector that's perpendicular to the, to the magnetic field or the component of the magnetic field perpendicular to the velocity vector, either way works. Go. The magnitude is given by that QVB sine of theta. Okay. So get familiar with that. The magnetic, the SI unit for the magnetic field is the Tesla after Nikola Tesla. And one Tesla is equal to one Newton amperes per, per amperes meter. You can do that in the notes as well. Here we go. Very important that you do that. You repeat everything that you do, okay? Right in here. Here you go. It's, so you can learn better this material. Force, right? Q, V, Cross Cross B. Now we're going to put the Vectorial symbol there at the top. Right in here. I'm gonna change the letters. Bb. And 
gonna put the subscript B here for you. So you know it's a magnetic force. Okay. So get familiar with the vectorial product and the magnitude of the magnetic field is going to be given by magnitude of Q. I'm gonna put magnitude of V as well, or you can call that the speed if you want, so you don't need to put any magnitude there. Go. If the charge is negative, you have to worry about the direction, right? We go magnitude of B, and then you gotta put a sine of theta. Here you go. If the angle between V and B is 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees is gonna be one. That what the meat for this chapter is all about. And you use the right hand rule, you go. Right hand rule, determine the direction of the magnetic force. Going back here, you go. Okay, that's 19.1. It's just a, a brief introduction that I did already in the lab. Okay, magnetic fields, I covered that in the lab. And that's what we didn't cover in the lab, magnetic force and a point charge. Okay, we call that is a sort of law, it's not exactly a law because it's covered by something else, but here you go, the cross product between two vectors. Any vector can be, two different vectors can be, you know, operated by a cross product. And those are the properties of this cross vector. If you, they are not commutative, okay? Only the magnitude of the cross product is a commuted, has a commutative property, only the magnitude. But when you do the actual cross product, the cross product is not commutative because B cross A is minus A cross B. If you do, okay, if you do V cross B, you're going to get a different vector when you do, you know, B cross V. Let's, let's do that together, here you go. V cross B is out of the plane of the screen. But if you do B cross V, B cross V are gonna get into the plane of the screen. So they're not, those, the, the cross product is not a commutative one. You can go to the right hand rule here to find the cross product, the direction of the cross product. Oh, here you go, the right hand rule. You put two vectors laying tail by tail, line up your right hand along the first vector, rotate your, the palm of your hand towards the second vector and the resulting vector points in the direction of the thumb. If you do it the other way, right? B, v, B cross A, the resulting vector is gonna be downwards. Here you go, vector symbols, 
the dot is out of the page, the cross is into the page. The circle is a cross, it's into the page. The circle is a dot, is the direct is a vector direction that uh, out of the page and into the page respectively. Okay. Note see that the work done by the magnetic force. By the mag not the mag by, by, by the magnetic field, but I would say by the magnetic force on a point charge is going to be zero because the work done, because the magnetic force will always be perpendicular to the velocity vector, right? The velocity vector is, is proportional to the displacement vector. And if the a force is perpendicular to a displacement, then the the work done by this force is going to be zero. Okay, so those, let me write down one of the consequences here. The magnetic force is always perpendicular to the velocity vector of the charge is perpendicular to the displacement vector of the charge. For this reason, the work done by the magnetic force will always, it's the magnetic force that does work, not the magnetic field, will always be Zero. That's what we have here. Okay, there are some interesting applications for that, especially in the deflection of cosmic rays, not just the deflection of cosmic rays, but also deflection of the solar wind the charged particles that comes from the sun and interact with the Earth's magnetic field, okay? So an electric charge that comes towards the Earth can be a proton or other types of charge. When they interact with the magnetic field of the Earth, they're going to rotate about the magnetic field of the magnetic field lines of the Earth, because there will be a magnetic force perpendicular to the velocity vector, just like in this figure. Into the page, in this case, the force is into the page, and so the charge will tend to rotate, okay? So without the magnetic field, the proton you know, will move straight down to our surface. But because of the magnetic field, there will be a deflection of the particle sideways that will keep it from reaching the surface. In general, those cosmic rays, those charged particles that are moved towards the Earth, they don't reach the surface, but they get trapped in the magnetic field. That's what we have here. You can do this Pratt-C problem, okay? With the velocity of those cosmic ray particles is six times 10 to the seven meters per second. And that would be the magnitude of mag the magnitude of the magnetic field of the, of the earth at that at a given point, okay? Well, what would be the acceleration of the protons? Magnitude of the protons acceleration. Assume that the velocity and the velocity of the charge in the magnetic field make an angle of 90 degrees, okay? So you need to get the charge of the proton multiplied by the velocity, multiplied by the by the magnetic field. then you can get also the acceleration. 
how does it work? Let me show you a, a drawing so you can understand that. Okay. Here you go. Here you go. So suppose that we have a magnetic field. Now, this point C, each of those dots that you see here is the direction of your magnetic field. I rotated my figure in the pro, in the previous figure that I have here. I rotated it. So, so now I'm looking at the magnetic field head on. That are those black dots are all about. The magnetic field are along the X direction, the Y direction, sorry. Take a look at the X and, and Z axis here, right? Here would be X and Y, here would be X and Z. So if my proton charge, my positive charge has this velocity vector right in here, my magnetic, it should be a 90 degree in both. The magnetic force will be towards perpendicular this velocity vector. And this magnetic force will tend to make my particle to move in a circular fashion. Make sense? Okay. Magnetic force can be calculated for that problem. And this force here, because it's perpendicular to the velocity vector, is going to act like a centripetal force. So this equation that you see here is going to be equal to mv squared over r, or ma, right? Using Newton's law of motion. Let's do that together. Here you go. Okay, if uh, let's assume that, uh, assume, assume velocity vector perpendicular to magnetic field. Okay. Velocity vector. Velocity vector of a charge Q. Velocity vector V. Charge Q. Perpendicular to the magnetic field B. Acceleration right. of the charge. This magnetic field that's what that uh, problem is all about. Solution, right? There you go. Theta is 90 degrees. So this equation ends up being QVB. Okay. The acceleration, according to Newton's law, is going to be mass of the particle times acceleration. And what we get? Get something like that. Here you go. You have that over MVB. You can find out the acceleration of this particle, which is going to have a circular motion. That's how you get this acceleration value. You have to know the acceleration, or the, not the acceleration, but the mass of the proton. You can do the same thing for an ion in the air. I'm not gonna do that. You have to know the mass of the ion, okay? The field uh, is horizontal. Now in this case, the 70, there is an angle of 70 degrees of the magnetic field with respect to the horizontal. In this case, the oxygen ion is moving east 250 meters per second. And you have to know the mass of this oxygen 
ion. It's an oxy O2 molecule, ion molecule, not the atom, right? Not the atom. It's a molecule, ion, ionized molecule. Okay, I'm not gonna do that. You can do that on your own because it has the solution here. Okay, you do the V cross B. And then you compare that with the electric force. That's what he's asking you to do. Compare the magnetic force with the electric force. Compare the magnitude of the magnetic force with the ion weight and to the electric, oh, not just the magnitude, not just with the electric force, but also with the, the weight. In a fair weather, electric field of 150 newtons Per cool. Let's 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 go through quickly that. So I will make a quick comment. Let's see what's the magnetic force first. Okay, so here you go. That's the magnetic force. Two times ten to minus twenty-one newtons. Okay. QVB. What about 10 to minus 21? Huh? Let's see what's going to be the weight. First, the electric field. Oh, the electric field is much stronger than the magnetic field, magnetic force. The electric force is much stronger than the magnetic force. Four orders of magnitude, 10,000 times stronger. Oh, wait a minute. Magnetic force on the ion is much stronger than the gravitational. Oh, it's much stronger than the gravitational force. Okay. Yeah, and much weaker than the electric force. So the weight, you got to get the mg. So that's what we have for this chapter. OK, there are other electron in a magnetic field. All you have to do is do the same type of solution. And we are done for this section. What you have here, charge it, is a continuation of what we started working on. Let's go get it. Take go. Uh, I'm going to show you the notes. What I'm going to do here, go. I found the acceleration. And now we're going to do 19.3. Charged particle moving perpendicular to uniform magnetic field. Okay. So you saw this drawing before in my PowerPoint. What we're going to do here? Okay, I'm going to show you what what he's going to do. He's going to show you how to not only to how to calculate the acceleration of the particle. Okay. Like we did. But we can also calculate the radius of the particle, which varies according to the magnetic field and the velocity. Okay, so here you go. There's an application in physics. Let's take a look here. Bubble chamber. Circular motion of charged particles in uniform magnetic fields has many applications. Okay, one of them is the bubble chamber. Uh, the chamber is filled with a liquid hydrogen. And immersed in a magnetic field. When a charged particle moves through the liquid, it leaves a trail of bubbles. 19.16 shows the track. Okay, this one here, made by particles in a bubble chamber. The magnetic field is out of the page. Magnetic force on any particle points towards the center of the curvature of the particle's trajectory. Okay. Using the right hand rule, using directions to show in 16. Okay, here's the 
trajectory, the circular trajectory, the circular arc of the particle. V cross B is a way. In this case, but the force is going to be towards the center, away from the center, but it's going to be towards the center because of the sign of the charge. Okay, so that's one application. Mass spectrometer. That's another important. That's an important instrument. Another application is a mass spectrometer. I talk to my students about that. Let me show you a drawing that I have for the mass spectrometer. Okay, here how we, let's see, accelerate the particle, right? Let's, uh, we can accelerate the particle through an electric field. But you, and, uh, and the mass spectrometer, if you go back here, to the drawing, here you go. What you have here, you, ac you can accelerate the particles through this, those two plates that have a uniform electric field. The electric field is not shown, but, but we do show an accelerating potential here, okay? And when it gets here inside this uniform magnetic field, the particle is going to move in a circular fashion. Okay. So what we have here, those particles, if you use a proper material like a photographic plate or even that phosphorescent material, you can find out where those particles got incident at this place and find out also the radius not only the radius of curvature, but also the diameter of this track. That's how I spectrometer, mass spectrometer works. Okay, so here you go. The basic purpose of mass spectrometer is to separate ions, charged atoms or molecules by mass and measure the mass of each type of ion. Although originally devised to measure the masses of the products of nuclear reaction, Mass spectrometers are now used by researchers in many different scientific fields and in medicine to identify with atoms or molecules. What atoms or molecules are present in a sample and in, and in what concentrations? Okay, so, so here is a sample mass spec, simpler mass spectrometer than the one that you have illustrated in there. So suppose that we have an ion source here of different masses. And they are accelerated through this electric potential. Okay. Okay, here you go. Ions of different masses. If the ions have different masses, but same kinetic energy before getting into the magnetic field, they're going to end up with different trajectories right in here, and I can prove that to you. Okay, let's do that together. That's an interesting problem. Mass spectrometer, let's take a look here. Oh, 17.19.4, right? Let's go, 19.3, charged particles moving perpendicular to magnetic field. Charged particles moving perpendicular to magnetic field. Okay. Going back here. I say they have the same, 
not the same kinetic energy, it would be right to say the same velocity. Okay. If they have different masses, they wouldn't necessarily have the same kinetic energy. Okay, so let's go get you go. So the situation is like that. We already calculated the acceleration of the particle in a magnetic field, right? That's the acceleration of the particle. But don't forget, and don't forget this is also a centripetal acceleration, right? I need to remind you that because the particles are moving in a circular trajectory, this acceleration that you see here is a centripetal acceleration. Okay, and here you go. And as you saw in mechanics, the centripetal acceleration is going to be V squared over R. Make sense? V squared over R like that. And then let's solve this equation for R. Solving the above equation for R. R, we get. So, I'm going to put the R first. I'm going to invert both sides of the equation. You know, it go like that. So I can solve for R. I inverted the left side. I'm going to invert the, the right side now. Go. Get this guy downstairs. In the next step, we are going to cancel out the Vs on both sides of the equation. Here you go. Okay, we're going to simplify this equation. And here you go. We get these different radii for different speeds and masses as well. Right? That's what we get. So suppose that the, we have ions of same velocity, but different masses. The larger mass is gonna have a, a larger radius. Not necessarily the same kinetic energy. Not necessarily the same kinetic energy. Okay, so particles, are different ions, different ions. Same charge, right? Accelerated to the same speed. Come on. We'll have radius of trajectory that will depend on their masses.
larger the mass the larger the radius of curvature of their trajectory you can you write that in terms of the kinetic energy as well right let's do that let's write that down in terms of kinetic energy just like the book says i did that in terms of the velocity but uh, what about the kinetic energy Let's see, we can accelerate those ions to the kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is what? K, K E, right? Half M V square. Right in here. Go. Like that. All right. Let's write it down now. This equation in terms of the kinetic energy. Okay. The velocity, when you write down the velocity in terms of the kinetic energy, is two divided by m. All right. But then you gotta take the square root. There we go. Here you go. And now we substitute that right in here. Okay. A bold equation in terms of the kinetic energy. Right. We get substitute that here. We go. And let's keep on going here. Okay, so now the mass downstairs here is gonna cancel with the, the, the mass upstairs here is gonna cancel with the square root of the mass downstairs. Like that. So here, okay, so, so let's go back here, right? Different ions of same charge accelerated to the same speed, okay? We have radius of trajectory that will depend on their masses, the larger the mass of the, the larger the radius of curvature of their trajectory. Here is the same thing, here you go. Different ions, ions of this, oh, let's put this way, ions of different masses of different masses having the same charge and accelerated to the same speed. Similarly, similarly, similarly ions of different masses having the same charge and accelerated to the same kinetic energy. Okay. We have radius of trajectory that will depend also on their masses, but it's gonna depend on the square root of the mass. The larger the mass, the larger the radius of curvature of that trajectory. Sometimes it's more convenient to talk in terms of the kinetic energy. Sometimes it's more convenient to talk in terms of the velocity, okay? And that's how we get for the mass spectrometer. So here you go. What we have here is a ion of larger mass because it have a larger diameter tra tra trajectory, a larger radius of curvature. 
And it's possible to, again, it's possible to visualize those ions or even electric charges as well by coating this photographic plate with a phosphorescent substance, the same substance that you saw the electrons interacting with, interacting with in the so-called CRT table, uh, CRT tube or Crookes tube. So that, that's how people would be able to measure the radius of curvature of ions in this type of device. Okay. You can go through this example as well. Okay, we have lithium. Okay, we have those two different lithium ions. They have different masses. One is heavier than the other, right? So in the mass spectrum, but they have the same charge. Because they have the same charge, they will end up having the same kinetic energy at the end of this plate here. Remember, the kinetic energy depends only on the charge. Doesn't depend on the mass, charge times delta V. That's why the book told you it's the same kinetic energy. But it's easier to understand in terms of energy, in terms of the velocity first, before we start talking about the kinetic energy. So since they have different masses here, okay, oh, here you go. Velocity selector so that the ions all have the same velocity. The beam then enters a region of uniform magnetic field. This is the radius of the orbit of the lithium plus six ion is 8.4 8 centimeters. What's the radius of the orbit of the trajectory, right? Of the lithium plus seven. You have to know the masses of those lithium atoms. You know, this guy here has a, approximately six times the mass, the unit mass units, approximately because of this number six. This one's gonna have seven times, approximately. It's not exactly because, you know, you have small differences there in terms of the mass of the proton, the mass and the mass of the neutron. Okay. Very small differences. So if the radius of orbit is 8.4 centimeters, what's the radius of orbit of the of this one here? Okay. We can use that in our formula, uh, like I, I derived before. I'm gonna do it slightly different, okay? M6 and M7, right? I do know, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, solution. Example, right? Example, lithium isotopes, you know? One, six units and the other, with seven units, lithium six, I'll put here lithium six plus radius of, let's see what's the radius. Let's go back, radius, radius, 8.4 centimeters. Eight point four centimeters. Oops. Find the radius of the lithium seven. Lithium six. I'm gonna put like a lithium six ion. Okay, as a radius eight point four centimeters. Find the radius of lithium seven a solution. And this example, I'm gonna do it slightly different because I already have the equation here. Example, one here, example 19.4. Example 19.4 in the book. Let's go ahead and get this 
me here. I'm going to approximate the masses. I'm not using the exact number there, but I, whatever result that I get is gonna be very, uh, the difference is gonna be very small, less than 1% difference. The kinetic energy is going to be the same because the lithium atoms have the same charge. Okay, I'm gonna do like that. Here you go, lithium six, equation for lithium six. Okay, mass of lithium six. Mass of lithium six. Kinetic energy of lithium six. The magnetic field is the same charge of lithium six, do like that, okay? And you do the same for lithium seven, right? You know lithium six, the radius of lithium six, 8.4 centimeters. So just replace six with seven here, All right? Kinetic energy of lithium seven, which end up by the way being the same as the kinetic energy of lithium six. By the way, charge of lithium six is the same as the charge of lithium seven. You saw that they are they have a positive charge, one positive charge, because they have the same charge. The kinetic energy is also going to be the same. Why is that? Kinetic energy of lithium six is going to be the charge of lithium six, which is Q times the potential energy, the potential electric potential, not electric potential energy, but electric potential that they are subjected to. Here you go. Delta V which by the way is also equal kinetic energy of lithium seven, like that. I'll call that KE. To simplify the notation. I'm doing it slightly different from the book. So now I can here write, but we also know that those, the masses are different, right? The masses are different, here you go. So I'm gonna write down the masses here. M6 is six units. M7 is seven units. Okay. Okay, let's rewrite the equation. Uh, here you're gonna put six units, right? Put between parentheses. Six units. The charge is the same. The charge here is the same. The mass is seven. The kinetic energy is the same. Here. So what do I do next? All I have to do is divide this equation by this other equation. 
okay? Or this, this equation by the other one. So you don't have to worry about doing complicated mathematical crunches, okay? Number crunching. So I'm gonna divide R7 by R6 equal R7 by R6. Sometimes it's easier to solve problems like that. Okay, QB is going to cancel, right? QB is going to cancel. The two in the square root upstairs is going to cancel with the two in the square root downstairs. The kinetic energy also is going to cancel out. What you're going to end up with, you're going, to, oh, wait a minute. We have six units here. I didn't change that. Did I put six units here? Six units. Yeah. Six units. The two here cancel out with this two. The U here cancel out with this U downstairs. And the kinetic energy here. That's a lot with the other kinetic energy. So what we end up having is the square root of seven divided by six. The radius is gonna be larger by this amount. And you do the math. Eight centimeters, right? A little bit more than eight cent eight point four centimeters times the square root of seven divided by six. You go. Go. Go like that. That's what we have for this example 19.4. He went through the whole, you no. Know, oh, yeah, here you go. Nine point eight centimeters he's getting. Cyclotrons. I have another, here you go. So you have another illustration here, okay? Here you go. Uh, we have this device called the velocity selector that uses a uniform electric field and a uniform magnetic field. The velocity selector is going to select only charged particles. That's not in the Let's see, that's not, uh, that's not in the book. The, the book kind of skipped that. It was supposed to show, was supposed to show that before, okay? For the, for the mass spectrometer. But if you set up something like that, okay? And you go ahead, put a particle here in this region of electric and magnetic field, this particle is going to be subjected to an electric force. And a magnetic force, if it has a velocity, Okay, with this velocity, the magnetic force is going to be to the right. And depending on the velocity of the particle, the magnetic force is going to cancel out the electric force. So particles that have a specific velocity, charged particles that have a specific velocity, may go through this region of electric and magnetic field. There's no deflection whatsoever. 
those who doesn't have those the specific the velocity they are either going to divert to the left or divert to the right they will divert to the right if the velocity is greater than a given value they will divert to the left if the velocity is less than that specific value that's what we call velocity selector okay that's one way of doing a mass spectrometer here you go we have this particle here and what we have here is the detector okay here's a little so okay phosphorescent screen right remember that Let's see, okay, particle in a magnetic field. You already saw that. Oh, here you go. The mass spectrometer. And here's an illustration of the mass spectrometer. The velocity selector plus a magnetic field outside. This magnetic field is not necessarily equal to this other magnetic field. Okay, the particle goes through this region of magnetic out, outer magnetic field and is incident in that plate that has a phosphorescent substance. Here you go, phosphorescent screen. Okay. So the next one is the cyclotron. Okay. Here we go. We're talking about go back here. We're talking about nineteen point three, right? Here you go. So those are devices that are available out there. And if you understand how those devices work, you can make a contribution that will impact your colleagues. Okay, so go mass spectrometer. Don't forget mass spectrometer. It's one of the devices. Spectrometer. Okay, in addition to the mass spectrometer, we have the velocity selector that I mentioned to you. Velocity selector. Spectrum is velocity selector plus a outside magnetic field. Outside magnetic field. And you can also do a mass, a mass spectrum without the velocity selector, right? Just like the book illustrated in there. Oh, and the other on on the other another device that you have is the cyclotron. Okay, so all these devices use the uh, electric and magnetic field. Let me show you how it works, okay? The way I like to explain my students is the following. Let's see if I get it, if I get that for you. I have a slide here for you. He is always, you know, important useful to accelerate electric charges as fast as you can okay one way to accelerate electric charges is by using a positive and negatively one positive and one negative plate okay that's one way okay if you want to accelerate this charge faster and faster all you can do is to keep the same electric potential but increase the distance between the plates so the particle would accelerate faster a longer distance and would end up with a larger velocity and more energy but there is a limit for this type of configuration the limit has to do with the size of the device Okay, it comes to a point that becomes very awkward to keep on carrying 
a large device. And then you may end up of storage room to put that in your in your lab. Makes sense. So people have figured out a different way of accelerating electric charges. Simpler, a simpler way, more compact one too. Not simpler because it involves electric uh, magnetic field as well. Okay, but, uh, but it's definitely is a more compact way and even cheaper, I would say. It is the cyclotron. We go. I'm gonna erase that stuff. I don't need. Oh, I need one more. Yeah, erase that. Let's see how the cyclotron behaves. Okay. Okay. It's always. I'm gonna put that in my notes. Cyclotron. Always useful. You know, there are, you know, not always useful. It is useful. To accelerate charged particles to higher speed for certain application. Certain medical applications, by the way, not the, just any application, but for certain medical applications. One way of doing that is by using two charged plates to accelerate charge. Okay. The larger distance between the plates, like the capacitor, right? Between the plates, the faster we accelerate a given charge. However, the device, once you do that, once, once you start doing that, once you start doing that, the device becomes bulkier. And this will accommodate in your lab. lab. To go around this problem. Scientists invented the cyclotron. It uses both an electric magnetic, both electric and magnetic fields. Both electric and magnetic fields. Accomplish the same result. Okay. In the previous case, this device use only an electric field. So let's see what was the smart way that uh, scientists discovered to accelerate electrons. Okay, the way we do is, is the following. Here you go. I'm gonna illustrate here for you. Remember, this is one way of accelerating electrons, right? You just two plates, one positive and another negative, like a capacitor. Let me erase this guy here. If the particle accelerates from this plate to this plate to a given velocity, if you want to accelerate it faster, you gotta put a, 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 a larger distance between the plates, okay? Like that. But it becomes bulky and bulkier to accelerate, and this device eventually doesn't fit in your lab. So what people figure out, they figure out a more compact device like this one that you're seeing. It is 
a rounded plate with a gap, with a little gap here in between. It's a D, now two Ds. One, two Ds, one inverted and the other in the right direction. Okay, so you have your, you establish an electric field in this gap. Here's one D, here's the, the inverted D. You establish an electric field here between this gap. This gap has a given distance. Start thinking what we are, how we can work something like that, right? You put your charged plate here, your charge, your charge, right, in there that you want to accelerate. And then you put a magnetic field in that D region. Okay. The charge is going to accelerate in this gap due to the electric force only. It's going to start from almost zero to a given speed. Okay, and then once it reach, reach the other gap, the other side of the gap, what's going to what's going to happen? It's going to escape that region and it's going to be subjected to a magnetic field only. You see the magnetic field there. By being subjected to a magnetic field, the particle is going to undergo a Circular trajectory, right? Here you go. At the other, here you go. At the mid of the gap, at the mid of the trajectory, at the other side of the trajectory. At the other side of the trajectory, now the part is going to re enter the gap where there is an electric field. But then at this point in time, what's going to happen to the electric field? We invert the direction of the electric field so the particle can be accelerated a second time. To higher speed. So what's going to happen? This particle is going to make multiple passes through this gap. Okay. Initial no at the first at the first pass. Here you go at the first pass. The electric, the velocity. You no, know, here you go. Oh, let's let's start it all over again. Here you go. Remember the particle started at rest, right? At the end of the gap, it's going to have a speed. It's going to undergo uniform circular motion. It's going to re-enter the gap. Just before re-entering the gap, the field is going to switch direction. It's possible to do that with equipment available in the lab. And the particle is going to be accelerated again to higher speed. So what's going to happen? The particle is going to make multiple passes through this gap. Okay. Now, the Circular trajectory is going to be have a higher, a larger radius, right? Compared to this previous pass. Electric field is going to invert again, and so on. This thing is repeated over and over again until the trajectory of the electron is at the edge of this table, of the circular table. That's how the cyclotron works. Multiple paths of a charged particle through this gap which ends up being equivalent to a very large device that wouldn't fit in your lab. If you want, you know, the, the rule of thumb there is if you have a very bulky device and you wanna make it smaller, try. If you have a bulky device that has very long, right? That is very long and you won't, won't make it smaller, try a circular geometry, you know? Try to see if you can convert your very long device into a circular geometry in which you can contain your particle in a circular geometry. That's what we did with the secret and we do with other devices as well. We are going to study this device now. Here you go. That, that's the same illustration that you see here. Here's the gap that I told you with the electric field, see that? And this is the trajectory of the charged particle. We have a magnet. South pole of a magnet, north pole of a magnet, producing a magnetic field in the vertical direction. Initial path is like, you know, initial path has a smaller radius and keep on building up to larger and larger radius of curvature until the particle reaches the edge of the cyclotron. Okay. 
we can, there are medical uses of cyclotrons, just like I, told, I mentioned to you. And let's take a look at this example 19.5. Maximum kinetic energy in a proton cyclotron. A proton cyclotron uses a magnet that produces 0.6 stellar field between its poles. The radius of the Ds is 24 centimeters. What's the maximum possible kinetic energy of the protons accelerated by this cyclotron? Okay. What's the maximum? Let's figure that out. So here you go, it's 24 centimeters, right? So we want this proton to undergo a circular trajectory that's gonna be, you know, oh, reach the edge of my cyclotron of, of this guy here, right? So my proton cannot have a trajectory larger than 24 centimeters, a radius of trajectory larger than 24 centimeters. That, how do we do that? Think about that. Okay, here you go. You know, here you go. Here is the magnetic force of the cyclotron. The charge, right? There is a proton. The velocity that we do not know, but we know the magnetic field. We know the mass of the proton. We do not know the velocity of the proton. And, but we do know the maximum radius of the proton, which is gonna be 24 centimeters. So here we are solving for V, V squared cancels the Z. We get Q, QBR over M. We calculate, we want the kinetic energy, right? So here you go. The kinetic energy is half mv square. We go, we square the velocity here. This m is gonna cancel out as this m, some of the, and you substitute all the numbers in there. Let's see what you get. Let's see what you get. You get 1.6 times 10 to minus 13 joules. Okay. If you want to accelerate this proton to a order of magnitude of energy, what would be the new radius of the D? Let's see. We're talking about 24 centimeters. Well, let's take a look here. Would be 76 centimeters. 10 times the kinetic energy is not 10 times the radius. 10 times the kinetic energy would be roughly three times Three, yeah, three to four times the radius of the cyclotron. So this is a this is a smart device that people came up with. And now try to figure out what would be the electric field required and the distance between the plates, right? To accelerate this proton to this energy. Try to find out. Oh, what would that be? So that's what we have for this chap, for this section. And I'm gonna have a little break. Okay, and, uh, and I'll be back soon. We're back here and now we are going to go to the next section is already covered part of it but there's a little bit more to talk about that you already know that 
if a charged particle is a subject to a uniform magnetic field, it will undergo a circular trajectory, right? And it's during in that region of magnetic field. Here you go, right in here. You saw that before, right? A particle, a charged particle subjected to a magnetic field will undergo a circular trajectory if its velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field. What if the velocity is not perpendicular, but makes an angle? Okay, something interesting happens. So suppose that this charge, this velocity vector, you know, is a little bit inclined uh, out of, a little bit out of the plane. What's gonna happen to its trajectory? Okay, it still will undergo a uniform circular motion, but then it's gonna have a second velocity component. One velocity component, the one that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, is going to make the particle to undergo uniform circular motion. But the other component that, that is parallel to the magnetic field is going to drag the particle along the magnetic field lines. Can you picture that? So here you go. Here's the magnetic field. Let me show you my hands here. Here's the magnetic field. Here's the velocity of the particle. Velocity of the particle right in here, magnetic field. V cross B, let's, let's, let's assume that the particle is positive. V cross B, the force is going to be in this direction. So the particle is going to, you know, to rotate about the magnetic field lines. That's what it's gonna do. Okay, right in here you go. Rotate about the magnetic field lines, the axis of the magnetic field line. Now, what if the particle has a component that's parallel to the magnetic field, right? There will be a component perpendicular, another component parallel. The perpendicular component of the velocity will make the particle moves in a circular motion around the magnetic field lines. But the velocity component parallel to the magnetic field line will drag the particle along the magnetic field lines. okay? So it's gonna be like that. Right? Velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field line, make the particle go in a uniform motion. The velocity component along the magnetic field lines will make the particle move, will, will make, will drag the particle along the magnetic field lines. And that's what you see here in this drawing. Something like that happens in the Earth's magnetic field. We have a helical motion of the particle. In either case, here you go. That one illustration of the helical path of the particle. And that again, that happens in the in magnetic field of the Earth. All those charged particles that come from inter interstellar space and also from the sun, most of them are trapped inside the magnetic field of, of the Earth and they move towards the magnetic poles. So those charges don't bombard directly the Earth's surface. Instead, they end up moving towards the pole and they do bombard the North and South magnetic pole. Okay. And they move, like I said, in a helical path. Provided of course their velocity, their velocity vector has a component parallel to the magnetic field. That's what you have to know about this. And by the way, it is exactly those particles that produce the aurora that we observe. When they collide with the oxygen in the higher atmosphere, those electrons, those charged particles produce that glowing that we observe, just like very similar to that glow that you saw in the Crookes tube that I showed to you before. Okay, this chapter here, let, let, let me just document here, Char Char charged particles on uniform magnetic field, okay? If the velocity component of the particle is perpendicular to the magnetic field line, line, comma, particle will undergo 
uniform to the magnet to the magnet field lines of a uniform magnetic field. The particle will undergo uniform circular motion around these lines. However, if the if the velocity, not, not the velocity component, is the velocity of the particle, right? However, if the velocity of the particle, however, if the velocity of the particle of a component, component that is also parallel to the magnetic field lines of a uniform magnetic field, the particle will not only undergo, not only undergo uniform circular motion around this line, but will also be dragged along them, along the lines by the velocity component parallel to the field. Velocity component parallel to the field. Okay? That's what you have to know about this chapter. And we can now move on to 19.5. And that is the, you know, the case of the velocity selector that I mentioned to you. Now we're gonna do it in a little bit more detail, okay? It's a very simple mathematical procedure. He go, ion source, electric field and magnetic field cross, depending on the velocity of the particle. I mentioned that to you. The particle can go in a straight, in a straight trajectory, depending on the velocity of the particle, or can go in a curved trajectory. And that's what we call the velocity selector, the device that's out there. Okay, we go. Charged particle in a cross electric and magnetic field. Particle in a cross electric and magnetic field. And magnetic field. Don't forget the fields are uniform. Fields are uniform. In, in a cross uniform electric fields are uniform. Put between parentheses here. Fields are uniform. How does it work? Let's go back to my drawings here. Here you go, right in here. We have a cross electric and magnetic field. Here's the electric field in red, the magnetic field in blue. They make an angle of 90 degrees. That's what crossed means. Okay, crossed. What does it mean? Perpendicular. Perpendicular. So let's see what's gonna happen, right? Let's see, uh, I, what, what do I want? You know, I want to find out the velocity given here. Go given a, a uniform electric, given uniform electric and magnetic field. Find the velocity of a charge particle Q for which electric and magnetic forces cancel out. So cancel out. So think like of this, like a problem like that. Think of this chap chapter as a problem like that, right? 
solution. By the way, given a minimum cancel out. Oh, don't forget if the cancel if the net force, the electric plus the magnetic force is zero, then the particle can move in a straight line, right? So here you go. We're gonna do the derivation. We know that the electric force in the charge is what? Electric force. And the charge is going to be Q times E. I also know that the magnetic force in the particle is going to be what? Q V B. Q V B. Velocity vector of the particle is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay. Given a uniform uniform electric and magnetic fields, find the velocity of a charged particle Q for which the electric field and magnetic electric force and magnetic force cancels out. Okay. E is perpendicular, e is perpendicular to B. So what do, do I want? I want the, the net force here must be equal to zero. Going back here, right? So here you go. Electric field to the right, magnetic field into the plane. You know, when those two are equal to one another, they cancel out and the particle can move in a straight line. Okay. So We go Fe equal to Fb, right? Qe equal to Qvb. Note that it doesn't matter what the charge of the particle, right? Because it's going to cancel out. The Q is going to cancel out in this equation. Q cancels out. And that must be the relation between E, B, and B. V must be E divided by B. Whenever the velocity of the particle obeys this relationship, the charged particle travels through the, electric, the region of the electric and magnetic field undisturbed. Whenever the charged particle has this velocity, the particle tra uh, travels, travels through this region of E electric and magnetic field and this turbid. Like that straight line. So we do that. That what this guy is doing right in here. Okay, V E over B. That's the velocity selector, application of the velocity selector. I already mentioned to you. And the velocity selector is used in conjunction with the mass spectrometer. With the mass spectrometer, we can find out the charge to mass ratio of an electric charge. That's called an electron. I mentioned that to you too, right? And that by Joseph J.J. Thompson using the, the so-called cathode ray tube that uh, 
device has also applications to a blood flow meter. Blood flow meter. Okay, let's take a look, quick look. That uh, this device is used in medicine, right? The principle of the velocity selector finds another application to electromagnetic flow meters used to measure the speed of blood flows through a major artery during cardiovascular surgery. Blood contains ions. The motion of the ions can be affected by a magnetic field. In an electromagnetic flow meter, a magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the flow of the direction. Remember, the velocity vector must be perpendicular to the magnetic field, right? The magnetic force on positive ions is towards the side of the artery, while the magnetic force on negative ions is towards the opposite side. Okay, here's the blood flow, here's the artery. Charges are separated by the magnetic force. And then when the charges are separated, ah, what happens? Something interesting happens. The separation of charges, positive charge on one side and the negative charge on the other produces an electric field across the artery. Right, here you go. See that? Separation of negative charges and positive charges producing an electric field. And those charges are going to accumulate up to a certain point until the electric field is strong enough to cancel, to produce an electric force that's going to cancel the magnetic force. This electric field, we can measure the voltage across this artery with a voltmeter. And from this voltage measurement, we can determine the electric field and the velocity of the ions. Okay? So here we go. The separation with positive charges on one side and negative charge on the other produces an electric field across the artery. As the electric field builds up, it exerts a force of moving ions in the direction opposite to that of magnetic fields. In equilibrium, the two forces are equal in magnitude. V is the average speed of an ion equal to the average speed of the blood flow. Thus, the flow meter is just like a velocity selector, except that the ion speed determines the electric field instead of the other way around. Okay, voltmeter and the Hall effect. The Hall effect is an interesting device too. And by the way, what you saw here is not less, not, not more, not less than the Hall effect. Okay, You're, we're gonna and there is a very nice video about the Hall effect on YouTube. It, this is a device that is used in cars. In a solid conductor, Hall effect. Uh, is similar to the principle of electromagnetic flow meter, okay? Let me get you to a, an illustration of the Hall effect here as well. Let me see if I have, oh yeah, here you go. Here is my, here you go. We start with a plate, metallic plate, okay? And we apply a potential difference between the ends of the plate, a battery. Apply, you know, use a battery. So, so you can get a current flowing through this plate. And then what else do we do? We apply a magnetic field perpendicular to this plate. Once you have a current flowing in the plate, you can also have a magnetic force acting on the charges. Okay, so here you go. And this magnetic field is going to drag the charge, the negative charge, to the bottom of the conductor. And you are going to have an accumulation of negative charges at the bottom of the conductor. Here you go. Here's the accumulation of charges. What you see at the top is not an accumulation of positive charges. It's not. Okay. It is instead a depletion of negative charges. You cannot drag those positive charges that are here in the bulk of the metal because they are too heavy. They are two times, two thousand times heavier than the, than the electrons. Remember that. But anyway, what you end up having is not only an excess of electrons here at the bottom, but a depletion of electrons here at the top. That's why you build up this positive charge, which, by the way, is going to generate not an electric field. Think about that, your electric 
charge flowing through the plate. This negative charge in the bulk is going to be attracted upwards. The more charges end up building up, the higher, the larger the force, right? The electric force. Until it comes to a point where you have an equilibrium and no charges are dragged downwards. Why the electric field uh, here is still weak, you're going to have more and more negative charges being dragged downwards. But then there will be a point in which there will be so many negative charges there at the bottom that no, none, the electric field is going to be larger and larger, and we are going to reach equilibrium and no other, and we will no longer have electric charges being dragged downwards, okay? That's what the whole effect is all about. It's the produce, pro production of electric fields by the application of a magnetic field in a moving electric charge. And then what do we do? We measure the electric potential between those two ends of the plate. Here you go. Here's my voltmeter. Apply it to the ends of the plate. The plate, of course, has a thickness that I didn't show in the previous slide. From this measurement of the voltage, you can multiply the voltage by D to get the, the D is the thickness of the plate, to get the electric field. Okay. I have, like I said, there is a nice video there in YouTube in which this guy built a, a Hall effect demonstrator using copper plates like that and a gold. Yeah, it's a gold sheet, right? Little sheet, very thin film, a gold film. It worked pretty well. Okay, that's what we have. Let's do this, ex this quick example. This one, here you go, oops, see here. And let's see. Velocity selector. Okay, applications of the balls. The last two selector to blood flow meter three. How you set? How you set? Okay, so we have this situation, right? The flat slab of semiconductor has thickness T half millimeter with one centimeter length, 30 centimeters. A current of two amps is a very high current. Be careful with this current if you're doing this experiment. Flows along its length to the right. Here you go, here's the conductor. A magnetic field is applied. Perpendicular to the flat surface of the slab, assume that the, the carriers are electrons. There are seven times 10 to 24 mobile electrons per cubic meter. What is the magnitude of the hall voltage across the slab? Which edge top is at the higher potential? Okay. So let's see, it's from the left to the right, right? Just like it go, just like I was doing. Current from the left to the right. similar here it's just this my sickness is less than the length right so we know already from my result that the lower end is going to be negatively charged okay so here you go again
it looks like I forgot to turn on the the share screen, right? So sorry for that, folks. So here you go. We're gonna do that all over again. Yeah, charged particle in a crossed field, right? Okay, so here you go, charged particle in a crossed field. Yeah, we're, we're doing that again, sorry for that. And I'm sharing the, the screen here. Okay, charge it particle across the E field. So the velocity select. Let's go there to the velocity selector. Here you go. Here's the velocity selector that you saw before. Cross field means the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field. The charge is going through this region of cross field. The velocity vector is perpendicular to the to both the electric and magnetic fields. Given a uniform electric magnetic field, find the velocity of the charge at particle Q for which the electric magnetic cancels out. This perpendicular to both the electric and B field. Okay. So here you go. Electric field is going to electric force is going to is a positive charge in this case so the positive charge is going to be attracted to the negative side of the plate and then you go ahead do the v cross b on the positive charge the magnetic force is going to be to the left because the net force is zero the particle, the velocity of the particle is going to be uniform throughout this region. It's not going to be deflected to the left. It's not going to be deflected to the right, right? So that's what this whole exercise is all about. So the electric force is QE. The magnetic force is QVB. In order for the two forces to cancel out, the electric force must be equal to the magnetic force. QE must be equal to QVB. Q cancels with Q. The velocity must be E over B. If the velocity of the charged particle, note C that, you know, it doesn't matter what the charge of the particle is. The only thing that affects the, the, the our result here is gonna be just the electric and the magnetic fields. So if the electric and magnetic field has this ratio, all particles, all charged particles with this velocity is going to fly through the region unaffected, undisturbed. And this type of thing has application in the velocity selector, blood flow meter, and how effect we use the velocity selector in a mass spectrometer. Use the velocity selector in a mass spectrometer. Let's, that's what this is all about. We, an application of the velocity selector is in the, is in the blood flow meter that we, I'm gonna show to you. Here you go, electromagnetic magnetic blood flow meter. 
And here you go, consider this artery, you know, blood flows through the artery, right? A large artery. As blow floods through an artery, you have ions that flow there in the artery as well. Blood contains ions, okay? So what do we do? We go ahead and apply an electric, uh, not an electric, a magnetic field, a magnet perpendicular to the artery. And then what's going to happen? Because the blood is flowing through the artery, the ions is also flowing through the artery. If the ions is positively charged, they are going to move upwards in the artery. And the negatively charged ions are going to move downwards. As they, we have, as they move upwards and downwards, you're going to have a buildup of the positive charges at the top and negative charges at the bottom. This buildup of electric charge is going to produce an electric field, a downward electric field. And this downward electric field is going to keep on building up until the net force, the net electric and magnetic force are zero. Remember, an electric field is producing an electric force now, right? On this positively charged particle. When something like that comes to this point, no more buildup of charges we have here in the blood. We go ahead and measure this electric field by applying a voltmeter between the walls of the artery. Okay. The electric field can be found by multiplying this reading from this voltmeter by the diameter of the artery. And from there, we find what's the velocity of the ions in the blood, which ends up being also the, the velocity of the blood. This is nice because you don't have to insert anything into the artery, inside the artery but just in the surroundings of it. So the, just the outer walls of the artery. Another device that I mentioned to you is the Hall effect. Okay, let's do this example, okay? So I explain, let's explain the Hall effect again to you, here you go. Hall effect has applications and we have devices in our car that use the Hall effect, okay? So get this, get for instance, start with, in order to visualize what the Hall effect is, start with a conducting plate, can be a metal, can be any metal, aluminum, can be gold, can be silver. And then you apply a current to this plate at this end here, those two ends, connect the battery, that's how you apply a current. When you apply a current, we are going to have an electron moving from the right to the left. In metallic plates, it is the electrons that are responsible for the current in the plate, in the metal. We apply a magnetic field perpendicular to this plate. And then what's going to happen with a magnetic field and a, and a charge in motion, there will be a magnetic force dragging this charge downwards. Okay, so here you go. When we have, and then what, what are you gonna have? You're gonna have a negative charge down there at the bottom. Because we ended up with a negative charge at the bottom, what's gonna happen? We're going to end up at the, with a depletion of negative charge at the top. Okay. What does it mean a depletion of negative charge at the top? I mean, depletion means we are gonna have a build up of positive charges at the top. I'm gonna illustrate that for you, here you go. Positive charges are very heavy. 
So they're not gonna move. Okay. But uh, it's a depletion, okay? It's not that we end up uh, dragging positive charges to the top. No, no, no. We end up, you know, whatever negative charges were at the top, we ended up being dragged at the, at the, to the bottom. Region of depleted charges. Okay, and there you go. We have a build up. Negative charge dragged to the bottom. Positive charges appear at the top because of the depletion of negative charges. Why, why the electric field is not strong enough? We still are going to have more charges build up, okay? At this point in time, the, we have this electric field coming from the separation of charges, this polarization of charges, but the electric field is still not strong enough to equilibrate the amount of charges that we have in the, that flows through the bulk of the material. So this charge is still gonna be dragged downwards until we have enough charge at the bottom and at the top that produce an electric field that's strong enough to counter the magnetic field. Okay, at this point in time, electrons flow straight without being, without being dragged downwards in this figure. We can find out the electric field, the internal electric field of this metal by applying a voltmeter across the, thick, the width of the device, those inexpensive voltmeters that I told you before. The electric field is gonna be given by V times D. Okay. That's how I, how voltmeter, how effect works. So let's take a look at the example. You know, what's the magnitude of the hall voltage across the slab? Which edge, top or bottom, is at the higher potential, okay? So here you go, the current is flowing from the left to the right, just like my illustration, right? My illustration, the current is also flowing from the left to the right. Oh. Here you go. From the left to the right. So at the bottom, you're going to have negative charges. Here you go, here we have uh, negative charges too. There's a mistake here. And at the top, we're going to have positive charges. So the higher potential is going to be at the top, not at the bottom. Go. If you look into YouTube, there is a really nice video in which this guy used a golden foil, just like an aluminum foil, right? But the golden sheet, sandwich it between two copper, two copper plates, attach it to a battery. And he was able to measure the electric potential difference between those two ends of the golden film, the gold film. Okay, so let's go to our example in the book. Okay, so we have the thickness, we have the width, one centimeter. So if you know what the voltage is, you multiply that by the width and we get the electric field, okay? Magnetic field 0.25 Tesla. The thickness is this one right here. The number of electrons per cubic meter is this one here that was given. Well, by the way, it's mobile electrons, not electrons overall, but just more electrons that, that uh, produces the current. Okay, so how do you do that? Here you go number of electrons per unit of volume. Here you go, let, let me do that for you here. 
the current, remember the current, the equation for the current? The equation for the current is the following. Is amount of charges, right? Delta Q over delta T. Delta Q over delta T. Okay, delta Q is going to be what? It's going to be number total, total number of electrons times the electric charge. Okay? Okay, so that's what you have. But there is more. Don't forget that we have, he gave us the density of electrons. The book gave us the number of electrons per unit of volume. And the number of electrons per unit of volume is going to be big N over volume. OK, right here, right? We know that. We do not know that. And we do not know that either. But let's see if we can somehow convert that into known parameters. I'm going to rewrite big N in terms of small n. Okay. And then the volume is going to be what? The volume of that plate. The volume of that plate is going to be the cross sectional area A times the length L. The cross sectional area is going to be the width times the thickness. Okay. Times the length. The cross sectional area is going to be the width times the thickness. Make sense? N times volume. Now we have written my N in terms of the things that we know. Okay, here we go. I'm going to substitute it here. You know, the width can be measured with a ruler. The thickness can be measured with another, with a ruler too, right? Length, the thickness, the width, and the length, they all can be measured. So we'll go ahead and substitute it here. Oops, right. That's what the current is. So I just rearrange it here, this equation. So it looks just like what you have in the book, okay? Density of, of charges per unit of volume, electric charge and area. Area is the width times the thickness. Width type time, width times thickness. And then we have L, L, which is the length of the, Conductor. I'm going to separate that. Here you go. I'm going to I'm going to rewrite that in the following way. Like that. Okay. This L over delta T is like a velocity. Okay. It's a velocity that we call the drift velocity of our charges. The drift velocity, the average velocity of the charges flowing through the metal. The book called that V sub D or drift velocity. Okay. We go. Drift velocity. Okay.
now recall that the electric field, right, from the previous, here you go, the electric field and the magnetic field, they have a relationship with the velocity of the charges. And this velocity now is what we call the drift velocity of the charges. It's called, the, we differentiate the, the drift velocity to the instantaneous velocity because the, the charges are moving very fast in the conductor, okay? But they're moving very fast, but you know, instantaneously moving at fast, but overall they're moving very slowly from one end of the conductor to the other end, just like that, okay? Do you see this little, this is small velocity from the left to the right? Okay, it's what we call the drift velocity. That's why you're differentiating that. Here you go. And we get, we can get the electric field due to the Hall effect. Okay, the electric field due to the Hall effect. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put even this subscript here for you. Hall effect. So here we go. We're gonna solve for the electric field due to the Hall effect. Something like that. Okay. But there is a relationship between the electric field due to the Hall effect and the electric potential and the Hall electric potential that V that we measured before. It is what? It is VH times what? Well, I, I call it D, right? But the book called W, which is the width, here you go, which is the width of the conductor, like that. We can solve this new equation for the drift velocity as well, okay? And we get, you know, divided by, B drift we can measure this one we can measure this one we set this one to a given value and now what else can we do we can make this equation equal to this equation here those are drift velocities that were obtained. Sorry, we can, we can, here you go. We can solve for this one right here, the drift velocity that I didn't do, didn't do, right? Let's do that. Yeah, let's solve for this other drift velocity that are at the top. Here you go. Divided. Okay. now make this one equal to this one okay that what we have right here what we have next one Okay. 
Okay. Okay, that I missed. Uh, okay, the relationship here that we had was division, right? That was the right one. That's what the, the one I was missing here. Okay, now we can do it. It's, uh, here you go, B, the drift velocity is VH over W times B. Okay. And that should be the W right in here. This W cancel out is this W. And we end up with something like that, IB. VH is equal to IB over NET. Okay. And if, if you plug in all the numbers, you get a whole potential of 0.89 millivolts. Okay, which you can confirm with your experiment, with the measurement of your voltmeter. That's what we have for this section. Nineteen point five, right? Let's go to nineteen point six now. Oops. It's magnetic force on current carrying wire. This one is quite straightforward. We started with the magnetic force in electric charge. So let's see, here you go, 19.6. Lots of things to cover, right? Magnetic force on a current carrying wire. Okay, so how how can you picture that? Let's picture that. What's going on? Let's see if I can illustrate that for you. We go so not this one let's see if i can illustrate that well well i'll have to do a, a different illustration let's see here okay here you go think about that you know um in the wire, we have charges that are moving, right? That are moving the wire. I need a different illustration here. Maybe the book has. Let's take a look at the book illustration. Let's see. Okay, here you go. Here we have a wire, right? Carrying a current. Current is flowing upwards, which means that the negative charges are moving downwards. I can make this illustration too, but uh, picture, you know, negative charges moving downwards and this wire is subject to the magnetic field. Okay. So if the velocity of the electrons are, is downwards, the force has to be to the left using the right hand rule, right? The velocity of the electrons is contrary to the direction of the flowing of the current. So velocity of the electron cross B is in this direction, but because the electrons has a negative charge, so the force should be from the right to the left. So if you have electrons moving inside the wire, you are going to end up having a magnetic field, a magnetic force, if that wire is subject to a magnetic field. Let's write it down. Here you go. Consider a wire carrying a current. Okay. The 
current in the wire is due to the electrons that are moving inside it. If the wire is subjected to a magnetic field, to a magnetic field, comma, these electrons, these electrons are going to feel a magnetic force. This cause a magnetic force in the wire itself. The wire itself. Okay. We can find this force by using that equation for the magnetic force in a current carrying wire. Let's go get it. Here you go. The magnetic force in a current carrying wire. Is right in here. In a in a not, not magnetic force in an electric charge. Here you go. Like that. Just remember that this V that you see here is in reality a delta X over delta T, right? Let's rewrite, rewrite that. Delta. I'm going to put delta R instead. Over delta T. Like that. And now we can recognize that the amount of charge divided by delta T is what? Is the current in the wire. Okay, so here you go. I'm gonna write that he write that like that. What you see here is a current I. And this delta R is a small is a piece of your wire. We can say L, you know, a length of wire. Okay, so let's take a look here. Oh, here you go, the L. And that actually a vector. This vector is in the direction of the current. So here you go. We call that now an L. L in the direction of a, the direction of the current. So there is indeed a force apply it to the wire and the wire is subject to a magnetic field. And that's something we can see in the, in the lab. There are demonstrations out there that shows this type of effect, like a, a displacement of a wire once you put it in, in a magnetic field. Okay, so we can have things like that. For think about power lines. Okay, think about power lines that carry currents. We have like this 125 meter long power line, which is horizontal, carrying a very high current, 2,500 amps towards the south. And then this power line is subjected to a magnetic field of the earth, which is roughly 0 0.052 millitesla towards the north and inclines to 62 degrees below the horizon. What's the magnetic force on the power line? Can you picture that? Okay, so let's see. You're gonna see how the, the, the by the way, the, the power line is very long, right? But there is a 62 degrees there. Let's see, 14 Newtons. That's the type of force that we observe for the magnetic force due to the magnetic field of the Earth alone. Okay. That is. 19.6. We are almost over with this chapter.
We are skipping this chapter and talk on the current loop. And we're going to move to the other sections, magnetic field due to an electric current. Okay, so, and the next one is going to be what? Ampere's law. So let's try to finish that. So what you have to know is that magnetic field just discovered some time ago, you know, magnetic field, this field due to an electric current. The source. Magnetic field is an electric current. That's what the source of a magnetic field is all about. Is an electric source, is an electric current. Where is again, where is skipping 19.7? That's important. If you want to produce a magnetic field, all you have to do is to run a current through a wire. That's what it's all about. Okay, moving charges produce a magnetic field. That, and we can come up with the magnetic field due to a, a long straight wire. It's possible to observe that. And it's also, you know, just by using a perpendicular wire connected to a battery and you put compasses, you can observe that around this wire. You're going to see that the need of the compass is going to be deflected. That's something that we can observe in real life. And that was important discovery, okay? That magnetic fields are produced by currents. It is possible to derive an equation of the magnetic field of a current carrying wire. It's uh, given by this equation here. I'm gonna show you how we can find that out very soon, okay? And the book doesn't do that in this chapter, but I will show that in the next one. Okay, note see that this relationship can be used, can be found using Ampere's law. So let's skip to section 19.9. You're going to see what Ampere's law is all about. One of the laws of physics. And here you go. One of the laws of physics, it states that the circulation of the magnetic field is equal to a constant that we call the permeability constant times the current, okay? Let's see what the circulation of the electric field is all about, okay? Here you go, 19.8 and it's gonna be together, right? 19.8 and 19.9. 19.9, this should do an electric current and Ampere's law. So what you have to know is that source of magnetic field is a current, is an electric current. What's something else that you have to know? Magnetic fields circulate around a current carrying wire. Something very important that you have to visualize. Unlike electric fields that radiate from the, from the charge, an electric charge, magnetic fields don't radiate from a, from, a, from a current. They circulate around the current, okay? I'm gonna give you an example here of, here you go. If you have a current like that, a wire carrying a current coming out of the screen, we find that the magnetic field circulates around this current carrying wire, okay? It doesn't radiate from the current, unlike the electric field. That's what Ampere's law tells us, you know? Unlike electric fields, which radiate from an electric charge.
and you can find out the magnetic field by using using Ampere's law. Ampere's law, comma, it's possible to find the magnetic field of some current distributions. I will provide that to you in the, in, the, in another video, okay? And just keep that in mind and uh, I'll see you soon, some other time. See you soon, bye-bye.